So, we discussed in the last video that people can build mental constructs to change themselves and their conditioning in spite of their genetics. So, next we must ask ourselves, when should we change and when should we accept the way we are? A fundamentalist religious person would have a cut and dried answer to this based on their ancient book told to them. But for the more enlightened mind, we can look at ethics. First off, we have to ask, does what I'm doing because of my conditioning or genetics harm anyone? Abuse, backstabbing, passive aggressiveness, or even being a drain on someone else or society is a reason to change yourself or get help. The inability to pull your own weight because of your condition means that you are leeching off of someone else. While some of this may not be your fault, one should strive to make oneself more useful to the person or people who are caring for them without expecting praise or thanks. If your preferences make someone feel uncomfortable by expanding their mind, that is not hurting that person and is in the long run helping them. So long as your preferences involve consenting adults, there is no reason to change what you enjoy. Next, is the benefit worth the risk of losing your identity? In an accepting healthy society, changing your orientation or preferences would be looked on as normal, or at least not their business, and not affect you. Sadly, in this society, you will be stigmatized and stereotyped, and many times you will find yourself making defense responses to people and becoming the stereotype of angry or going out of your way to make people feel uncomfortable unless you find a healing accepting group. Prior to finding CFI, I had both of these reactions from just losing my religion. Alternative lifestyles get even more flack and attacks. Mind you, there are genetic traits that harm the population or other individuals in the population and do not structurally work and therefore must be restricted or treated. People who are sociopathic are at the gradient end of functioning mirror neurons and feel no empathy for others and tend to treat them like cattle or objects. At the Columbus gathering, I was reminded of the variety, as many of the atheists on YouTube are varying ranges of the psychological and social gradient. I had someone tell me that he had to cut out because the crowd was too much for him. This extreme occurs when the senses work overboard. It has been found to be useful in times of danger, as these people are more sensitive and better able to detect danger. But in good times, that sensitivity tends to be looked on as uptight or antisocial, which makes them less desirable in the good times. Introverted, super-sensitive people tend to only make up about 20% of the population for this reason. Introverts judge extroverts and vice versa. I know people who go into groups because they love being in a group. Having Asperger's, I think they're insane. As for me, spending too much time in a large social environment feels like swimming in the middle of an ocean and I get fatigued. The people on the far end of this gradient are the autistic people who have so much sensory overload that they can't distinguish things like language from their senses and tend to only enjoy simple things like puzzles and writing with low stimuli. Then there are people who are so addicted to groups and social interactions that they can't focus or think for themselves outside of a group. These people thrive on noise and social interactions and can pass on their genes well, but will die quickly if separated from the group. Variations are very, very important for the future of human society. In the short term, uniformity is useful and lets the powerful stay powerful, but over the long haul, a society will decline if they maintain the same uniformity. Paranthropus boisei was perfectly adapted to his environment, while Homo habilis was a scavenger and adaptive. Habilis didn't do as well as boisei, but then the environment changed and the boisei were unable to adapt fast enough. Over the long term, a society that embraces and acknowledges differences and creates systems to let them thrive will reach their maximum potential and be able to change. The problem is that change in evolution is very slow and is hard to see until it is too late using common sense. Research is counterintuitive to our short-term mindsets. Instead of viewing us all as being the same and having the same needs, we should expand our minds to view all of us as different with differing needs and be eager to learn about the lifestyles of others. Like a world of the future in Doctor Who with species of aliens living together as friends and learning each other's culture, physiology, and lifestyles. We should be a psychologically as well as culturally cosmopolitan world. 
It requires effort and work from us all, and stereotypes are quicker and easier. And being only around people like us makes us feel safe, but they may not be the same as you psychologically at all, or they may be faking their own self to be uniform. Studies done on children have found that they begin to develop natural us-versus-them reactions starting at the age of three. When asked to spot the bad child, the child will more likely pick someone who is not of their ethnicity or gender. Identity is very important to a child in this stage, and they will emulate the people they identify with. As we expand our understanding and diversity, we will have to overcome this natural drive that we have to stereotype. Increasing awareness of differences as opposed to isolating and expecting them to change or suffer is key. If we keep these people isolated and remain ignorant of differing points of view, we are in danger of creating intellectual incest and producing an echo chamber, which creates enemies and prejudice out of potential friends. One step to increasing a cosmopolitan society is in our schools. Schools are increasing their integration of learning disabled and social acceptance of children with social disorders, and they are promoting diversity, well, except in Texas and Arizona. Montessori schools realize that there are multiple styles of learning, which would give children who are at a disadvantage in our cookie-cutter education system equal opportunity. Increase in these kind of schools would be a long-term benefit to a city or a state, but of course they can't see past their tax forms when it comes to this kind of investment. People from coastal cities in the U.S. seem to be much more accepting of diversity because they grew up without a choice in the matter, being surrounded by and having to work closely with people who are different from them. Thanks to the internet now, people out in the sticks even are now being forced into talking with people who are different from them, and the adults who cannot adjust to this change are having serious issues with it. The internet is truly a cosmopolitan place. That may very well help us understand each other and develop the best solutions for our common problems.